hi everyone, it's Rashida, your fave CRA. Um, and after 10 years of clinical research industry experience, I decided to create this YouTube channel um, for anyone seeking information about the industry, how to navigate, navigate a career as a CRA, um, and also ways to set yourself up for success. Even if you don't have plans to becoming a CRA, um, this channel can give you some really good insight into the industry and what our work as clinical research professionals entails. Uh, so today I'm so excited. I have a special guest, Elizabeth, who is the CRA helper. And she created an amazing podcast that I recommend to everyone who's seeking information um, about being a CRA. Um, it's called Let's Get Clinical, where she talks about what it's like to be a CRA from traveling tips to monitoring best practices. So hi, Elizabeth. Thank you so hi. much. For <laughs> And it's so funny because this is so different than a podcast being on camera. So, whoa. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for agreeing to um, meet with me this way. Um, so I want to just start off with how you were introduced to clinical research as, as a whole. Yeah, so it was actually in college where I found out about it. And it's funny, I was one of those students that always changed their major. So I... <laughs> So for the most part, I wanted to be an optometrist for the longest time. Then it was like pediatrics, neonatology, okay, pre-pharmacy. And then I switched to biology. And then while in school, um, two of my friends we were walking and she was like, I got this brochure and this is a new major and it was clinical research. And I was reading all about it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want to do this. And we all three switched to clinical research and we were actually the first three undergrads. That shows how long ago it was, but we were the first three years. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that's how I actually learned about it. Awesome. So I, I feel like a lot of people kind of stumble upon clinical research, but it sounds like you were very intentional in saying, okay, this is something new. I'm very interested about it. I'm not a hundred percent sure kind of what I want to do, but it's something that I think I can pursue. Mm -hmm. That's Definitely. awesome. Yes. Okay. So like, what was your journey after you, you know, got into the program and learned about it? What was your career journey like? Yeah. So I was doing my internship with a company that, uh, focused on manufacturing drugs. So I was working with GMPs versus GCPs, like we're used to now. And even though I did learn a lot, we were, I was in compliance and I saw what an FDA audit was like. And, and so it was like, so cool. So during that time, I was like, it was three years after three years, three months after graduation. And I um, was either going to work at a lab at again, manufacturing, or I got a call from a recruiter and they had actually openings for, it was entry-level in-house CRA positions. And so I was like, so it was like two completely different pathways, lab or clinical research. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I went the clinical research path. And so I was an in-house CRA for about a year. And then I went to become a CRA two um, in the clinical department and then was an on-site monitor, gosh, for like the next 14 years, road warrior. Wow. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, yeah. I'm always amazed at, um, CRAs who actually travel for like a good amount of time. Cause as you know, no, like traveling takes a lot out of you, right? Sometimes yes. you wake up in a hotel and you're like, oh, what city am I in today? <laughs> or you'll go to an airport and it's like, okay, did I get a uh, Hertz or enterprise or what, what is going on? So it can be kind of bizarro and it's, it's hard on your body and mentally, and, you know, just yeah. being away from your home base a lot can, can be very taxing. And I tell people all the time, like, yep. even though there are so many perks to being a, a monitor yep. and you are helping, you know, clinical research as a whole. So like what our job is, is very important. Personally, it's still a very taxing um, role, which is kind of why, you know, <laughs> It's very important for people to really know what they're getting into. So I, I want to also talk about just being a monitor for you and what that meant and like how difficult or easy was it for you when you first started? So like you, uh, like you said, um, so definitely the importance of, okay, I'm, I'm looking at this research data that is going to affect FDA decision-making. Um, this is going to protect, you know, patients. I want to make sure the data is valid. So, and I'm, and this is good to, uh, skill to have as a monitor, but I'm very anal and, I, <laughs> and meticulous detail. So it's just like, 
So um, I just knew it was very important to, um, it was just very important to me to be very detailed, very prepared. But like you said, on the other hand, on the flip side, it is very taxing. Like there were times I just wanted to be at home in my own bed. So I would do like a 20 hour day where it was like, get up early, get a direct flight, drive it, you know, an hour outside of Philly, come back <laughs> and then take a I flight. Back home. Yes. yes. <laughs> I just want to be in my own bed, you know, but, um, but I love the role. And one thing I do love to share, especially when I'm training new, um, new BCRAs is it's not a nine to five job. You know, it's definitely, you know, working at baggage claim or, you know, <laughs> you know, working in, in the, the rental car. Yes, yes <laughs> exactly. So I definitely always love to share that. And like you said, traveling, awesome. But um, there were times I wouldn't leave the hotel room. It's like, go to your site, go back to the hotel room, mm-hmm. work late at night, mm-hmm. then, do, you know, so, you know, and it's just, um, so I used to get made fun of for, by the airport staff. They're like, oh, you're going to West Palm Beach, you're going to the beach. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I, wish. <laughs> I wish, but yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I absolutely though, loved every minute of it and never gets boring. Never, it's never monotonous and you learn so much and, and being a part of the different, um, therapeutic areas and indications. And you just feel like you said, you're part of that bigger picture and it's mm-hmm. so important mm-hmm. and it just made me want to do a good job. So, you know, these medicines are safe for our families and everyone out there. So Absolutely. Yeah, I love it. So good. (laughs) So, you know, clinical research is a it's a huge hot topic right now. Um, A lot of people that may not have known about the industry are now questioning, you know, our practices, how we're developing drugs, different career paths. Um, There are so many opportunities available right now. Um, How or what do you think is the best way currently? on how to get into a role as a CRA? Cause I get that question asked all yes. the time. Like, yes. I'm like, well, clinical research associate is not an entry level role. Number one, you can't just jump out the bat. I don't think anymore. Yeah. I think years past, maybe that, that could have been a thing, but I think yeah. with the importance of what we do in our role and just the vast amount of people who are available and able to do this, it's yeah. not considered like an entry level. So, you know, what are some of the best ways that you think um, people can become a CRA? Yeah. So like you said, it's not cut and dry. Like anytime, like I always would ask somebody, how did you first learn about clinical research? Which like you said, people stumble into it. And the next question is how'd you become a CRA? And everybody has a different story. It's just not cut and dry. So definitely what I've learned um, is definitely at least a bachelor's degree. And most of the time it's preferred to be in a scientific discipline, scientific area. So they might say, you know, allied health, life sciences, biological science, nursing, you know. Um, Now they do say it's preferred to be in a scientific background. It might not be the end all be all might not, you know, some companies, instead of making that a requirement might be more amazed that you have research experience, Mm -hmm. you know, so, um, but for the most part, I do see scientific area, scientific background. Um, so then after the degree, like you said, it's not easy to find entry level CRA roles. Now there's one company I can think of that has like a really comprehensive training program. So they're like, yeah, this is the bachelor's we'd like you to have, but you don't have to have research experience because we Mm -hmm. have our own training, you know, so that's great if you can get in with them, but you know, it's competitive and they have to have an opening. So if you can't get in with a company like that, then definitely I would normally see that at least one to three years of research experience is required to become an entry-level CRA. And like you said, there's not a ton of openings, but the research experience is so huge and you can get it from so many different levels though. So you could be at a site and and be a study coordinator or clinical research coordinator, which study coordinators make great CRAs. (laughs) Oh my gosh, listen, I'm with you. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes. So um, they could be research assistants, data entry coordinators, regulatory coordinators. So that's a way to get research experience or at a CRO level, like me, I was an in-house CRA. Mm -hmm. Um, And let's see, clinical trial associate, clinical trial specialist, project coordinator, project specialist, whatever company you work for is a different name, (laughs) but that role is a way. Um, Data management. I had Mm -hmm. people programs that were out of data management. Um, IRB coordinators like that do administrative tasks for an IRB and get research experience under their belt that way, even at academic sites, you know, may get research experience. Um, Yeah. So if you're actually going for your bachelor's in a scientific area, try to find an internship, (laughs) get that research experience at the same time, you know, so that's a good way. So definitely um, that's what I've seen on average that's required. And so once you get that research experience under your belt, then 
keep an eye out for those openings because um, as you know, a CRO could get awarded a huge study yes. and all of a sudden you see all these openings. It could change on a daily basis. Um, so have that CV ready, <laughs> that curriculum vitae, our resume in the research world, having it ready. So when you do set an opening, you are ready to apply. And I actually did make a little note. I'm all about checklist. <laughs> no. of, of course you did, right? <laughs> of course. So, so I, um, there was actually some really unique positions I had seen before, like when I, I was developing like um, uh, a little freebie of entry level companies. And some of the openings were new to me. There was like an assistant CRA at a pharma. There, I was like, oh, I was like, that's a good way to get in. You yeah. Know? Um, a CRO had an entry level clinical trial project coordinator, and they said, new graduates, welcome to apply. Nice. And what was another one? Um, oh, another CRO, there was an internship for an in house CRA. And then the degree, degree required was working toward a university to undergraduate degree in life sciences and project management assistant, uh, assistant, sorry, associate project coordinator. And the degree mentioned was a college degree, preferably health scientific field but they did say the research experience could be substituted for education. Ooh. So, yeah. So it was like a lot of cool stuff. I was like, Oh, well, that, those are cool ways. Cause like yeah. experience is so huge. So um, getting that under your belt, then you could get that CRA entry level um, CRA entry level role. And then, you know, once you have at least two years of monitoring experience, that's it. Belt, they're all over you. Yeah, like, you, can go, you were all over like vultures. on yes, a they are. Yeah. <laughs> it's, so worth it. it's so worth it. Yeah. It and don't, yeah, like we said, just not giving up and, oh, signing up for email alerts. Mm. If there's not an opening, get that alert and um, indeed.com and ZipRecruiter, stuff like that too. Yeah. Um, sometimes there's even companies I'm not even familiar with. And I'm like, oh, you know, and yeah, so. Yeah, even okay. with me being in the industry for these 10 years, I, I honestly do not know all of the vast amount of companies. And the reality is that there are new companies popping up all the time. We have acquisitions and mergers happening yeah. all the time. And yeah. so it's really a great time to be curious about clinical research and really seek out that information, which is why I send people to your podcast. Oh, so I you. found, listen, I found out about your podcast. Um, I think it was last last year because I was looking through my messages like when was the first time I reached out to her so it was May of 2020 and I had been listening to a series of your podcasts and I'm like oh my gosh where was this information <laughs> when I was first starting out because you know we're in the airport a lot we're traveling in cars we're on yeah. the plane a lot so I used to listen to podcasts all the time and yeah. I think if I would have had your podcast just kind of playing as reminders and like tips to say okay this is something I need to focus on when I'm on site I think that would have made a world of difference and so I send people yeah. to your podcast all the time so Tell me how you came about even starting it. <laughs> it was okay. So, you know, working at a, um, a CRO, we have the billable positions, non-billable positions. So for those that aren't familiar, you know, billable, you're assigned to a study, non-billable, like line managers, trainers, you're not affiliated with a study. So you're considered non-billable. So like you said, we had a merger happens all the time. <laughs> so, so we had layoffs and I actually wasn't affected by the first round, but a year later, my role was no longer needed, but, uh, but yeah, so we had layoffs and I still wanted to train and clinical, you know, a clinical research trainer is not something you see a lot mm -hmm. for opening. So my sister-in-law was like, do you, you know, you love to train. Have you ever thought about developing your own course? And I was like, no, you know, and it was funny because my brother still to this day, can't believe I did it. You know, he thought I would be like, no, <laughs> but she was actually taking a training on how to develop um, digital courses. And she told my brother, she was like, you know, I thought I was learning it for me, but maybe I was learning it to help your sister. Oh, nice. so, um, yeah. So that's how that happened. And the name is a real quick, funny story. I was like, I want to help aspiring CRAs. Um, and new series, you know, um, to gain that confidence. And so I was like, oh, okay, maybe CRA prep or something. And so she was helping with the, me uh, get the domain name. And she's like, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. I was like, why? And she was like, if you type in CRA prep, it looks like crap rep. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I was like, no, 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 we Word can't do placement. <laughs> like no so I was like you know I want to help aspiring series I want to help um, others gain their confidence and like you said give them tips um, that maybe took me years to learn mm -hmm. so I was like okay CRA helper so that's how that name came so awesome. <laughs> okay so let me take a step back so after okay. you were a traveling CRA mm -hmm. you then became a manager and then a trainer 
oh yeah, I'm sorry. Duh. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so I was content being a senior CRA. I like, like we talked about, I loved it. Um, and it's a blessing because you get great performance reviews, you get merit increases. So even mm-hmm. though you're in that same role, you still, it's kind of like a raise you get, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's great. And I was happy with my sites being responsible for me. And, but I did always say if it, anything involved training, I did want to do that. So um, yeah. So my manager said that there was an opening with the monitoring foundations um, training and I was like, okay, I want to do it. So I did switch to that. So yeah, I became a trainer and a manager. It was like the same title clinical. Oh, operation. okay. So you were doing it in tandem. So you really yeah. kind of trained newer CRAs um, into like being really good CRAs. Yeah. So yeah. Cause some of them, it used to be where they didn't have to have previous experience and we would interview them. And, um, if they knew, you could tell who really studied GCPs and, and who knew, you know, I was like, cause there were some that didn't have previous experience, research experience. And then we did take in the program and train them. And then others, um, did, but then it became to a point where they had to have previous research experience and, we would train them. So they would get hired and also be in our 12 week program. And then they graduated out and became, ah. yeah, series and would be signed off on the different types of visits and stuff. And how long did you do that? I did that for about three years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. I would say it about helped years. you develop like what you wanted to talk about. You yeah. were working with people to know, you know, what works best for people with this type of experience, this type yep. of background. Yeah. And okay. everybody learns in a different way. So it yeah. kind of gives you that practice, which we know from experience of different sites. I mean, you have to train some this way, talk to some this way, you know, it's like <laughs> somebody. Oh, handled it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I learned that a lot. And um, yeah, so, and then I would manage like between the classes, I would also be their manager in between classes. And then they would transition to their permanent line manager when the next class started. So oh. I got experience managing too. So, yeah, yeah so that was different. Cool. So <laughs> what advice would you give newer CRAs? Okay. Other than listening to your podcast for sure. But like- <laughs> and that's why I wanted to offer those tips because you know, some things you learn, it takes years or you're just out with that certain person or you're like, man, I wish I would have known that. Like you said at the beginning. Mm-hmm. So that's one of my goals too, is to help people build that confidence. So for me, for entry level, I could go on and on because that's what my whole course is. So I was like, okay, what should I share? So then I thought, well, let me share what I learned as a manager perspective with those new CRAs okay. that could help them. <laughs> so, so I made a little checklist. No, I'm just kidding, but uh, <laughs> but I didn't want to forget to include. But um, so definitely, as you know, usually now we have instant message, right? Mm-hmm. So we can um, instant message like, hey, I need to, like let's meet or can you chat, you know, um, can ask a question and usually it'll show someone's availability. So it might be like green, you're available, red in a meeting, you know, um, yellow, maybe stepped away or just really reviewing something intently and you're not on your computer. So then the gray was like, you're not online, you're not on your VPN, you're nowhere to be found. No, but so a lot of times I would try to train or just remind the newer series, like, Hey, you're, um, be available. Communication mm-hmm. is so important. Be accountable. Show your manager you're trustworthy because a lot of roles, a lot of the CRA roles you're working from home. So, and it's new for a lot of people and especially, um, you know, some of the younger ones and actually senior series, not only the new ones, but we had some senior series that were nowhere to be found and their deliverables were late. So yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, all levels, but, um, but definitely for the newer ones, I definitely want to encourage them, like show your manager that you're accountable and you're available when sites need you, you're available. And it's not to micromanage, but your sites are going to need to reach you, especially when the study's new, just getting started, or maybe they have an issue. And then your manager or your study team, there may be a new update or they need to meet or follow up. So you just want to make sure they can reach you and not have to chase you everywhere. So I love to tell them my um, new series that, and then also those deliverables, those metrics, knowing metrics. what, yes, <laughs> <laughs> I was like setting phone reminders, outlook reminders, because I didn't want to be late. And so just knowing those deliverables that they need to, to have, and to make sure they're on time and how important it is, because even me as a newer CRA, um, I don't, I don't think I realized how important the metrics were until I grew and was like, Oh, okay. If these reports are late, you're not, not only is that not great, um, uh, because you're, uh, you know, you're not going like you're contracted with a, the sponsors to have your reports on time. And we're not meeting those contract obligations, but also for safety purposes, you know, integrity of the study, you want to be documenting things um, in a timely fashion. So um, I learned so much about the importance of metrics, but 
just knowing those deliverables, setting reminders. And the one thing I do always remind them of um, is just because your report is submitted to your lead or to your reviewer doesn't mean, well, it's on them now. <laughs> because if it's late, it falls on the CRA, no matter Absolutely. what. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. yes. We are a, a <laughs> metric driven industry, right? So like yes. metrics not only play into, like you said, patient safety and project yes. deliverables, but also finances when it comes to the company. So if they can't yes. show that you're doing what they're getting paid to do, then that's a problem for the sponsor or whoever yes. is providing monies for this study. So good yes. advice. Thank you. Cause I, I, even as a senior, I'm like, okay, my drafts do this. Okay, the lead has it. Let me check back in two days. And then the whole it's a lot report. of following up. Yeah, it is. A lot it of is. following up. And I definitely want to encourage, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm almost done. No, nope. oh, <laughs> but um uh also not being afraid to ask questions. Mm-hmm. Like I would never because sometimes when you're new, you're thinking, oh, they're gonna think I'm, you know, don't know what I'm doing. And you know, I would never I, as a manager, I was more afraid if they're not asking me any questions, you know, I want them to ask me, you know. <laughs> so, you know, and no matter what level CRA we are, when we're assigned to a study, there's always questions, um, you know, and there's things that a site's going to ask that you're like, okay, I need to confirm this with a medical monitoring lead. So I just would never want a new CRA to be afraid or to think they'll look bad. So I definitely want to encourage that. And um, that extra preparation, you know, like I always talk about checklists. I should mm-hmm. um, sell that. No, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but checklist, but um, especially as a newbie, you want to make sure it's so detailed, giving yourself reminders, like, you know, when I'm checking that, you know, equipment for a study, don't forget to check the calibration, you know, things that become second nature as a senior, um, you know, I would just definitely recommend having really detailed checklists just to, it's all in one place. And I had one graduate that sent me like a four page PSV checklist. It was so detailed. He's like, will you check it out for me? Give me feedback. I'm like, yeah, oh, he was so wonderful, <laughs> but, um, he's a senior now. <laughs> so, awesome. yeah, so he, um, but yeah, so just making those detailed, be prepared, knowing where to find everything, you know, being yes. very referencing personal. all of the documents yeah. that you have yes. at your disposal. Um, and I think yeah. even with questions, I always encourage people to, and even sites, I'm like, yeah. have you looked at the protocol? Have you looked at the lab manual? Because honestly, a lot of the questions can be answered there. And then maybe you need you know, extra details to make it more clear, but it also shows that you have initiative in saying, hey, I checked, and this is what I would do, like, when I would send emails, I would say, hey, I looked in section 5.2 of the protocol, and this is what I saw, but it's still not very clear, because that still shows that, you know, you know what you're talking about, you've done your due diligence in looking at the materials that you have, but yes. it's still not clear. So can you make it clear for me? <laughs> I love that you mentioned that because the same thing, if I couldn't find something, I'm like, now I checked the share drive, but you know, I couldn't find this, you know, like you said, I want them to know that I'm not being lazy. I yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then I would keep my own FAQ, like of questions <laughs> I had asked because I didn't want to ask the same question again. So I'm like, <laughs> it's so important. That's very, I love that you brought that up. That's a good point. <laughs> oh, well, Elizabeth, what do you have new in store for the CRA helper? Ooh, that is a good question. I've actually been praying about what to do next because I still, um, you know, because the course has been launched. I guess it was in November that it was launched. And it's so cute. I'll still hear from people like, oh, thanks. I built my confidence, you know, and it's, and I'm like, oh, so, um, so now that the course is launched, I, that is a good point. I don't know if there's another one you know, um, that's going to come out next or, or just a completely other training opportunity in general. It's definitely something I've been praying about, like where to go next. So, so so stay tuned. So stay tuned. Yeah. I really don't know exactly. I know it sounds stupid, but (laughs) no, it doesn't. I mean, I think, I think you, you have what some years on having episodes for your podcast. So that's a lot of information for people to go back and reference and understand exactly what goes on when they're on site or hearing some insight about FDA audits and and how to get prepared with that. And so I think even if you don't come out with anything else ever again, (laughs) what you have out there is really good information. You are providing something that a lot of us wish that we had at our disposal, you know, earlier on in our careers, but I'm going to make sure that I can do my part in saying, you know, this is something available. I think that everyone should listen to it, take all the information in and use it at, at 
at your your leisure. Um, so if if someone wants to learn more information about your program or your podcast, where can they find you? Yeah, so I have everything. Um, of course, I'm on um, you know, social media, like, you know, Instagram, LinkedIn and, and Facebook at the CRA helper. And then also everything is on my website, um, www.thecrahelper.com. <laughs> so, um, and it has like, like all the links to the different platforms that host the podcast as well, um, as the new course, um, as well as links to like CV review, coaching calls mm. and things like that. So, um, but yeah, I have 21 episodes of the podcast, but like you said, I was like, oh gosh, I probably should make some more episodes. And I'm just kind of in that standstill moment, like what's next. So, yeah. but definitely the, um, the course is kind of an expansion of the podcast is like the same style, except it goes deeper. And, um, yeah. So, and people who want to earn soaker or ACRP points. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's, that's, a huge I've had to do that too. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so it's been so fun. I, I love it. I, as you can tell, I love clinical research. So, um, and I love to help people, you know, feel confident. And it's so important mm-hmm. to have that, that work ethic. Like I've come behind some seniors that I'm like, what happened here? <laughs> like, yeah. What were you doing when you were on site? Yes, yes. <laughs> and like you said, the data is just so important and subject safety is so important. So quality is close to my heart. So, um, yeah. So thank you so much for having me. I, I've yes. been Absolutely. I'm so, I'm so happy for you. I'm excited for everything that you have in store for you in your future. Um, And if you need any help with anything, you know where to find me. Thank you.